want to thank the organizers for having me here. Uh, it's a great honor. Uh, I want to apologize for speaking English. Uh, you would forgive me even less if I tried to speak French. The one good thing is that uh, I will try and get your forgiveness by not going on too long. So uh, I will try to make this short. But my other problem is when I look at my paper, what I'm trying to do is explain one really difficult sentence by referring to four even more difficult sentences. But I guess this is an old style of Heidegger research that we've often been doing. I'm not trying to underwrite, I don't agree, that I'm not defending Heidegger, I'm trying to understand what he says and what I'm trying to do is reconstruct a certain path of thinking that he takes. And my starting point is those lines of Herdelin to which he frequently appealed in trying to understand the turning, the Kira. Wo aber die Gefahr ist, wächst das Rechende auf. In English, this tends to be translated where the danger is there also grows the saving power, or that which saves is better. What does this mean? Why would anybody believe this? How do we get there? What kind of thinking, perhaps that is the most important question, uh, leads us there? And what I'm going to do in this paper is juxtapose those lines uh, with a sentence, uh, as I say, more enigmatic even than that one, from the letter on humanism, where we read, with healing, evil appears all the more in the clearing of being. Mit dem Heilen zumal erscheint in der Lichtung des Seins das Böse. This sentence is followed by three others to which I will refer. Elsewhere, I've tried to give an exposition of these sentences. Today, I'm just going to draw on that exposition to try and take a broader view. The passage continues, the essence of evil does not consist in the mere badness of human actions, but rather in the malice of rage. Both of these, however, the healing and raging can essentially c occur in being only insofar as being is itself what is in strife. In it, the strife, is concealed the essential provenance of nihilation. As I say, not easy stuff. And if we put it in context, uh, Heidegger here is continuing the polemic against Sartre, with which the letter on humanism begins. He's just referenced the idea that the human being is the shepherd of being. And in these lines, having referenced evil, he turns towards this problem of the nothing. And the main thrust of this account of nihilation in Letter on Humanism, then, is to say that it is not the human being as subject who annihilates, which is how he understands Sartre in being a nothingness. Rather, he wants to say nihilation belongs to being. The human being annihilates only insofar as it belongs to being and uh, now we have to try to take that back into the discussion of evil. What has this annihilating got to do with evil? And what has evil got to do with being and time? And what is metaphysics? Because what Heidegger does in these two paragraphs that address Sartre is he's saying that he 
uh, already in being and time and what is metaphysics was addressing this nihilating. He says, the nihilating in being is the essence of what I call the nothing. Hence, because it thinks being, thinking thinks the nothing, to healing, being first grants ascent into grace, to raging its compulsion to malignancy. So why does Heidegger want to refer being and time to the thinking of nihilating as a thinking of evil? Isn't this precisely what Levinas warned us against in that famous uh, article in Le Nouvel Observateur in 1987 in the wake of the Farias debate? Levinas asked, can we be assured, however, that there was never any echo of evil in being and time? And what Heidegger seems to be saying here is that there was. But of course, using a very different conception of evil from that that Levinas offers us. It is not a moralistic conception of evil. But perhaps you think I'm going too fast to relate this thinking of being as evil to being in time. But if we look at the contemporary text, Anaximander Fragment from 1946, we read that the destiny of being is evil. And he makes the marginal note to that sentence uh, in his own copy, collapse into beings through the oblivion of being, compare being and time. So again, what has being and time got to do with the destiny of being? Well, we all have an answer to that insofar as we relate the Seinsvergessenheit to Seinsverlassenheit. But why are we passing through evil? What does evil mean here? To understand that, we need to go to the Abendgespräch, the evening conversation in a prisoner of war camp in Russia between a younger and an older man. This is a text dated from 8th of May, 1945, the day on which the Allied powers accepted the unconditional surrender of Germany, and which is published in volume 77 of the Gesamtausgabe. Notice that so many of the texts I'm having to go to to understand this difficult passage from Letter on Humanism was not available to anybody at the time. Heidegger was certainly not imagining anybody could understand what he was saying. He didn't. That didn't bother him. Uh, now that we can understand what he's saying, maybe it does bother us, but that's for you to decide. So as with the letter on humanism, the evening conversation makes it clear that evil is not being thought morally, and for the same reason, he substitutes for the word berser the word berzatiger, uh, malice. And in the Arban Kashbrek, he insists that the malice occurs as the devastation, Havustum, the devastation of the earth and the annihilation of human essence. Devastation, he says, means here that everything, the world, the human, and the earth will be transformed into a desert. And the desert is Heidegger's word for the deserted expanse of the abandonment of all life, that is to say, of the abandonment of being. Heidegger 
distances his thinking of malice so far from morality that he thinks of morality as conventionally understood as a symptom of the devastation. The pursuit of what are ordinarily conceived to be the highest goals of humanity, he lists things like progress, equal employment, opportunities for everyone, uniform welfare of all workers, and so on. Uh, all of those are said to conceal the devastation. And he insists further that one can spread the devastation, imagining that one is doing good. The younger man in the dialogue explains, under the appearance of a secured and improving life, a disregard of life can occur. And so all these efforts, uh, welfare for workers, equal employment, and so on and so forth, are, he suggests, acts arising out of a high regard for life, but in fact belonging to the annihilation of the human essence, because these acts take life as the highest value. And for Heidegger, life cannot be the highest value, and he insists that uh, being is, from the very beginning, thought in terms of life, but this has come to a culmination in Hegel and, above all, in Nietzsche. And so Nietzsche, in particular, becomes, in this dialogue, the object of Heidegger's uh, attack. Heidegger considered Nietzsche's doctrine of discipline and breeding, Zuchtung, as an extreme affirmation of morality. The pure will to power is, one of the, the dialogue partners says, least of all a beyond good and evil, if there can at all be a beyond evil. In the same place, the will itself is said to be evil. But what is meant is, of course, not a judgment on the human will as such, but rather the will as a word for being says the destiny of being as evil. Whatever one wants to call it, whether one wants to call it an evasion, a diversion, an outrage, Heidegger is saying that, uh, and I think there is no ambiguity here, that if one sees only the human corpses, if one sees only the devastation of cities, then one does not see the devastation as he understands it, because one is not yet seeing it in and out of Sein's Verlassenheit, in and out of the abandonment of being. And it is only from this alternative understanding that one can say that the devastation is, in Heidegger's sense, evil, that is to say, the malice of rage. It's only, to emphasize this point, it's only insofar as we see the devastation not in moral terms or in human terms that the devastation enters into the healing and can say that evil appears in the clearing of being. Indeed, in the evening conversation, he announced that evil, or more precisely, malice, may very well remain a basic trait of being itself. Being is evil. <coughs> so, to recap, I've so far emphasized the way that this line of thought is concentrated on the period 1945 to 1947. These are the texts on which, from which I've been drawing. 
But we need to go further back to understand how Heidegger arrives at this point. And we need to link it up with his thinking of Machenschaft and therefore with the notion of technology to therefore understand why uh, this thinking of evil might throw light on the Hilderlinian phrase about the saving, that which saves. Growing where the danger is. He doesn't, Helden is not saying after the danger, then the saving, which I think is how some people want to read it. It's where the danger is, there is that which saves. Similarly, it's with healing that evil appears all the more in the clearing of being. And this is already reflected in the treatise Das Ereignis from 1940-41, where he talks about an epoch in the history of being. Heidegger writes, being conceals its essence after its emergence in the first beginning. The concealment Let's come into being, that is now into power, Macht, the abandonment of beings by being in the form of beingness as machination, Machenschaft. And then he says, the agathon, the good, is its essence, evil. Uh, I was going to talk a little bit about uh, racial breeding, but I think I'll omit that to try and keep true to my promise about the time and also because watching your faces, I think I'm being controversial enough, I don't need to go there. Um, so I so far focused on Heidegger's rejection of science contention about the uh, uh, by being hu the human being being the source of annihilation and focused on how the essential source of nihilation is concealed in being itself, that uh, this takes, helps us understand how evil appears all the more in the clearing of being. But what about the healing? Why the healing? What, what imposes that on thinking? And to understand that, I think we have to go uh, to 1936, the lectures, the decisive lecture course on uh, Schelling's philosophical investigations into the essence of human freedom. And let's not forget that uh, anybody writing on Schelling today, whether in France or Germany, uh, or, or even in the United States, and not many people can cope with Schelling in the United States, it has to be said. Um, they all reference Heidegger. Heidegger's lectures from 1936 are still the decisive key for understanding uh, Schelling's text. And Heidegger is clearly drawn to this text because, again, Schelling is not looking at evil. Uh, it's allegedly a text about freedom, but Heidegger insists it's a text about evil. And Schelling is not talking about it as in a moralistic sense. It's evil as a universal activity, an unmistakable general principle. And even though Schelling is trying to take evil out of a uh, moralizing perspective, nevertheless, Heidegger insists that Schelling is still understanding evil as sin, and so that it is within a Christian perspective. And so, uh, there is a certain distance between Heidegger and, and Schelling, but it's nevertheless, I think, an indispensable text for understanding what Heidegger was saying about evil in Letter on Humanism, and therefore, from my perspective, what he's saying about the turning. Now, there are three things here we must focus on. First of all, Heidegger takes the language from which he draws his own discussion of evil from Schelling. 
particularly the word grim. Uh, which translate as rage, uh, and which I will return to in a second. Secondly, he understands Schelling to, in some sense, be giving a phenomenological account of evil. Uh, and therefore, it plays into the discussion of concealing and unconcealing uh, that Heidegger is engaged in himself, in his own discussion of the relation between healing and the unheil, unheil, uh, which he associates with evil. And thirdly, and most importantly, he understands Schelling to be introducing another way of thinking. And it is only as so far as we enter into this other way of thinking that we can understand what Heidegger is doing in these late texts. And it is for this reason that Heidegger uh, refers in the Schelling lectures to uh, this whole uh, tradition of thought on which Schelling draws, the Christian mystics, Eckhart, Burma, uh, and so on, as offering a new start in metaphysics. And he will go on to say, uh, this is ansatz is the word, uh, that evil itself offers a new start in metaphysics. So first, the phenomenological point. And the phenomenological point is that the good does not show itself directly, but through evil. And this is what Heidegger is, uh, this is why Heidegger takes up the word grim, which is used twice in Schelling's text, once in a quotation from Franz Bader, uh, the person who sort of reintroduced Jakob Burma to uh, the thinkers of that time, and uh, once in the following sentence where Schelling writes, even the most dissolute and false life perceives God as consuming rage, grim, and is posited by the attraction itself in an even higher tension against unity until it arrives at self-destruction, self vernichtung and the final crisis. Now, to capture that thought, Heidegger introduces into his exposition of Schelling's text the term Aufruhr, this, which is not to be found in uh, Schelling's essay. It means something like insurgency, uprising, revolt, sedition, or whatever. But Heidegger tries to encapsulate Schelling's text in the single sentence, evil is the insurgency, Aufruhr, that consists in perverting, Verkehrung, the ground of the essential will into the reversal, Umkehrung, of God. And in doing that, Heidegger is clearly drawing on Franz Bader's account of evil as a positive perversion or reversal of the principles. Now, I insist on the word Aufruhr here because it becomes the key word in Heidegger's discussion of evil in the Abendgespräch, even more important than the word uh, grim or rage that we've already talked about. In evening conversation, the younger man says, malice, Heidegger's word for evil, malice is insurgency, which rests in rage, such that this rage, in a certain way, conceals its fury, but at the same time, always threatens it. The essence of evil is the rage of insurgency, which never entirely breaks out, and which, when it does break out, still disguises itself, and in its hidden threatening, is often as if it were not. So there is this play of concealment and unconcealment, which uh, 
generates this uh, play between healing and uh, that which rages, uh, the evil itself. The oblivion of being, of course, cannot, as such, of its own nature, show itself. It threatens as destruction, but in so doing, it still conceals the true devastation. And now we come to, as I say, what I think is most decisive here, the way of thinking that Schelling drawing on Jakob Burma, most importantly, uh, that allows Heidegger to say, evil determines a new start in metaphysics. And Heidegger adds, brings about a transformation of the question of being. Evil does that. But it only does that insofar it is thought from this other perspective. What appealed to Heidegger in his reading of Schell was how what was initially presented as the opposition of good and evil, the Gagan sense of good and evil, becomes transformed into a duality <coughs> excuse me, which is separate from all opposition. It's that movement that takes place in Schelling's essay that gets Heidegger's attention. Schelling had been forced at the beginning of his essay to treat opposition and duality as synonyms. But once he had the resources in place to separate them, he had set himself the task, quoting Schelling, to seek that which lies outside of and beyond all opposition. So insofar as evil is locked in a struggle with good, as Schelling suggests, a camp. This war, this uh, struggle rather, is not seen as a war in the way that morality sees it. Schelling writes, the passions against which our negative morality, war, wages war, are forces of which each has a common root with its corresponding virtue. The soul of all hate is love. And in the most violent wrath, so only the stillness of the most inner central, father's term, return, uh, is attacked and excited so as to show itself. Again, the phenomenological aspect, it shows itself through this different perspective. And so, in place of a thinking governed by opposition, Heidegger turns to a thinking governed by strife. We, of course, know the word strife, strife, from the origin of the work of art essay. But here, it is given a uh, particular uh, different direction, recalling that in the passage from Letter on Humanism, which I began, Heidegger says, being is in strife. We hear in Heidegger's exposition of this, Jakob Burma's claim that life is in strife. And the word Heidegger uses to develop this is the word Gegenwerf. Counterthrow. And remember that when in letter, letter on humanism Heidegger says, as I reminded you, that the human being is the shepherd of being. He also here calls the human being the existing counter throw of being. In volume 
86 of the Gesamtausgabe, in notes Heidegger makes, we don't know exact date, but sometime in the 1940s, uh, Heidegger turns to Burma's text, The Way to Christ. And he quotes from Burma. And the visible world is a revelation of the inner spiritual world, out of eternal light and out of eternal shadow out of spiritual working. It is a counterflow, Gegenwart, of eternity, with which eternity has made itself visible. So Heidegger has taken this, this term Gegenwart not from Taula, uh, but from, from Burma. And so Heidegger asks of Burma, from where and how is evil and torment, wrath and the anger of God? And Heidegger's answer to his own question is everything reveals itself only in its counterthrow, the good only in evil, light only out of darkness, spirit only in terms of the base. And so what I'm suggesting, I don't know how far it actually gets us, I'd like to think it helps, that the turn is not a turn from one thing, the danger, the oblivion, to another thing to which it is opposed, the salvation, the sun insight into that which is. It's certainly not, and we all know this already, a turn in Heidegger's thinking, that at least that it would be that only in a derivative sense. The turn lies within the thinking of the umkirum and the furkirum of evil, as Heidegger finds it, in Schelling and uh, Schelling read from the perspective of Franz Bader. Let me, as I close, refer you to one of the other places where Heidegger refers to Hölden's lines from the poem, Pat Moss, with which I began, Bo aber die Gefahr ist, vexed das rettende Auer. I'm thinking of the essay, Wozu Dichter, which again is from the same period from which, on which I'm focusing. And after quoting these lines, Heidegger comments, perhaps any salvation, any brittle, other than that which comes from where the danger lies, is still within the unhail, the unheil. But the sense in which the heil and the unheil are related is made clear by a further passage toward the end of the essay where Heidegger writes, the unhail, as the unhail, traces the healing, the hail, for us. Everything reveals itself only in its counterfeit. We can add to the sense of a salvation that grows in the danger the healing in the unhail, the sense that the healing arises only in the echo of evil, of the unhail, that we, alongside Levinas, must hear in being and time. 